All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Majestic School for Human Rights. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the actual strategy and tactics behind organizing and community organizing. This is perhaps really the crux of what we've done in the Majestic School and what we want you guys to take away from the school. Up until now, we've spent a lot of time talking about the history of South Carolina and the world that we live in. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the theories behind capitalism, behind democracy, and so forth. But now what we're doing tonight is taking a lot of these ideas and boiling them down to, okay, well, how does all this matter in relationship to organizing? Because at the end of this class, we want you guys to really think of yourselves as organizers, as people who are heavily invested in communities, Above all, even if you're not sure you can organize your, your kitchen pantry, much less group of people, at the very least, because I really can, but whatever. At the very least, you should be able to think of yourselves as informed citizens who can and will be able to organize effectively amongst your peer groups, amongst other groups of people. Really, when it comes to the Majesta School, we're answering a question that academics love to ask. So what? Why learn all of this? Why get invested in reading and writing about the history of South Carolina, about the ideas behind capitalism and democracy and socialism and so forth? Well, this class tonight really gets at those theoretical underpinnings of organizing. And as you're going to hear this evening from myself, from Brett, from uh, Todd Shaw when he joins us later this evening, this isn't just theoretical. A lot of this has uh, real world evidence, both historically and in the present day. And again, I think our timing for this class couldn't be better because we're seeing some of the lessons about theories behind organizing and community development really playing out in real time, both in ways that are arguably good or bad, depending on who you ask. Um, so, Brett, uh, do you want to start us off? I might as well, Robert. Um, and I do want to uh, do a, um, uh, what, a Mikopa or here we go, guys, that we're in the subjective portion of the Majesco School. There is definitely an objective portion where we talk about history, and we hope that you find our history more subjective and factual than the history that you learned in school. Now, we're talking about how we, and I've had a role in this for the last 50 years, um, how we analyze what we know about history and how how the game's played. I mean, we've got protests in the street that are protesting what's happening, but what's happening is the way the game is played and understanding how the game is played and who made the rules and who benefits from them now and how you go about changing them to get what it is that you're protesting about. There's really a critical difference between um, protesting and actually protesting in a strategic fashion to leverage a game that eliminates that which it is that you're protesting about. And so I want to start with <clears throat> what we start with in the, the study guide this evening uh, is why do you want to do this? What is your motive? Why do you want to be an organizer? Why would you want to protest anything? And I really think that it's very important that we are doing it for what I consider to be the right reasons. And I can use the, 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 uh, a sermon that Dr. King gave, and it's, it's an old sermon that's been given before King gave it, and he, he noticed that in 19, I think it was 57 at Ebenezer. It's a 30 minute long sermon, and I, I do, it may be, it may be on, it may be a link to this, this class, we have a link to it, that um, King talked about the drum major instinct. And, the, the, and it's really easy to see when you think about it. The drum major instinct is what drives a person to want to be at the beginning of the parade. And that it doesn't necessarily mean that they know where they're going or that there's anybody following them because it's an instinct that is perhaps just a human instinct to want to be somebody, to be important and to get out there and lead. And that King criticized that instinct. And there's some biblical reference that perhaps one of you know better than I, um, and that he, he was, had to explain that the drum major uh, isn't, isn't the way he used it as pejorative, and it isn't necessarily something you want to aspire to, and he said, if you call me a drum major, call me a drum major for justice, 
in essence, because he's doing it not for himself. And so there's this collective understanding that I think needs to motivate those of us that are doing the work that really what we're confronting is a, a gestalt, a, a more a cultural, cultural hegemony would be what uh, Gramsci would call it, where the culture, it, certainly the Western culture, certainly the American culture, is oriented around profit, which is oriented around individualism. The United States is oriented around exceptionalism. It's even oriented around white male patriarchal exceptionalism. That's not a parade that I want to have anything to do with and have been resisting well, ever since I got woke when they, I, don't graduate, I mean, it was a long time ago when I was confronting racism and South Carolina segregation. And uh, those of us that were raised well have a hard time practicing that because the culture that dominates the society dominates everything about it, dominates housing, dominates education, dominates healthcare, dominates everything, is a for-profit system. And that's where the word capital comes in. And I'm really much more concerned with being able to have a society where social issues are much more important than money. And that's where socialism comes from. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And so we see, we see societies where they have social constructs that they organize and the children are raised around where they actually have, there's 100, I think 120 plus countries that have maternity leave, that have sick leave. And that um, some places have maternity leave that's a year long after you have the baby and the daddy can share it with you. So the, the, it's built so deeply into the fabric of some societies that they um, actually, um, they don't live to work. They only work enough to live. And here we got a, uh, bust ass to make the same thing our folks made in 1970. Most of us are living at a, a weight range that is the same as our parents and some of them, even our grandparents. And so there's some really significant problems here. And um, one of the things that as an organizer, we want to hold ourselves up to understanding why we're doing things. And so that's kind of my pitch about what's your motive? Why are you here? Um, does anybody have a comment or question or criticism about the whole notion of why we would want to hold our organizers up to a standard that isn't self-serving? Hearing none, um, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about that cultural hegemony term that I just used. Um, Daniel, you pronounce it Theodore Gramsci different than I do. Would you say it correctly? Gramsci. Gramsci? Mm -hmm. uh, what, 1930s Italian? True. Right. He came up with this notion that as Marx is talking about money and economy, Freud's talking about sex, and, and Gramsci is talking about who controls the culture. And right now it'd be Nike <laughs> and Coca-Cola that um, our culture is oriented around stuff. And so that's some, the whole concept of cultural hegemony is something that as organizers, we want to kind of like tune into because we're losing that game. And I really, I'm, I'm thrilled that there's a, a, new, a new awareness sweeping in new generations of people that aren't buying some of the old, uh, the old tropes and the old lines that, that uh, get people's attention. And so we need, to be, we need to be the latest. We need to be cool. It needs to be fun. We need to be hip. And you need to get rid of like, or at least work in a more cooperative fashion with the, the old guys that are from a, a different generation. All the music I listen to, the musicians are dead. And um, I fit, it's kind of like my father. But the, uh, the question of who controls your, your culture is, is really significant. And that leads right into like who controls your education. And that's what we've been talking about for the first seven classes in, in the, the people's history. But the strategies and tactics part that we're dealing with tonight takes those elements that we've learned analyzes, theoretically analyzes them as we did in class, uh, what was that, eight, and helps shape our, our strategy. That I'm looking to, I just got off a, a, a phone call and an email exchange with an organization that the Progressive Network's been working with since we started. And it was one of the first policy issues we worked on because 
looking at the problems that we were trying to solve and we identified race, racism as South Carolina's largest impediment in our founding conference in 1996, that affects everything, it affects everything. Certainly not the only problem, but it, it affects everything. And so we're looking at, well, who, can, who writes the rules, who controls them? And as the politicians, and we're looking at, well, who puts the money in? And that's the corporations. That 80% of the money going into our political structure comes from businesses that benefit from having a for-profit system and governments that's geared to be business friendly. And so South Carolina was the last state in the nation where a citizen could go online and see who gave their politician money. And uh, I would go into this ethics commission and ask to pull somebody's record and I'd have to sign in and they would tell the person who's looking at their record and you couldn't leave anything. You had to make notes with a pencil. And uh, we, we, the Progressive Network got a grant, $10,000 grant. This is after we introduced a bill that would um, let people run for public office on a grant, like, like a grant for smart kids to go to college. This would be a grant for people that would run for public office without taking any private contributions. And uh, great idea that you couldn't sell to the 170 incumbents because they won under the current system. But the organizing around a great idea to highlight the influence of money on politics. And so, not getting any traction on the bill we introduced to have an electronic filing system, uh, there are the government's response, the legislative response was, oh, it takes too long. It's too much, too, it costs too much money. We can't do that. And so we got a $10,000 grant and hired young people and some retired people and, and uh, asked the ethics commission if we could copy some stuff. And they said, yeah, um, what do you want? I said, everything. And so we rented two copy machines. And, and paid people 600 hours. And they copied every piece of paper to election cycle, about a full election cycle. And they copied you know, the legislators and the governors and the lobbyists. And we sent it off to this new group in Montana called the National Institute on Money and State Politics. And that group, that's the one that I just got off the phone with. What, what's this now, 20, 20, 22 years later. And I need to know what industries that supported, that, so, that were basically the governor's task force to accelerate South Carolina and put us back to work? Who, who was that? Who was on that task force? And so taking the corporate names of the people on that task force and running it through their database, they come, they, I could do it, but I didn't have time. And some of you need to learn how to do it. Uh, they came up with um, a breakdown of all the legislators that got money from all the companies that, that were involved in the governor's task force. $1.3 million in the last two years. Jay Lucas, the Speaker of the House, got $9,000 in the last two years just from the hospitality industry. Now, Speaker Lucas is going to be in charge of determining what the House hears and does and it taking the governor's budget. The governor's budget on the COVID money, $2 billion federal money, um, He's, they're going to sit on half of it for later, and none of it, none of it has any protection for workers, and there are no rules in South Carolina that would require the workers, to, the employers, to take care of the workers. But that's something we're working on, predicated on the analysis of who makes the decisions to be able to actually affect the lives and protect the lives of working people in South Carolina. It's probably close to 2 million people that this will affect that's an example of a strategic application of an analysis of who's got the money and who's making the rules that we're doing literally a minute before this class started. And that, those are tools that we want you to have as an organizer. We're the only people in South Carolina I'm aware of that's using it. And so the tactics that flow from understanding that strategy will be, and then uh, I'm going to be able to present to some sympathetic legislators this information, both in the House and Senate. We have, we have members. We actually have a, I don't know if uh, Representative McDaniel was with us tonight, we have a representative in the House, and uh, Gilda Cobb Hunter uh, is one of the founders of the network, and Mike Fanning is one of our members, and he's quite a force in the Senate. So th these are the pieces of the puzzle that we have organizers have put together to be able to understand and analyze the problems, create a strategy to deal with them, and implement tactics. Now, the tactics that we'll be pushing forward is we're setting up a a Zoom press conference 
with the head of the FLCIO, the State Labor Federation, the head of the NAACP, the state conference. They hadn't even met each other until we introduced them. And a medical doctor and um, somebody else in the mix, I can't remember. For them to do a Zoom press conference about the fact that South Carolina, not only do we not have sick leave, we have, we have a law that Henry McMaster signed in 2017 to prevent you from having sick leave. And that the people that sponsored the law that we fought from 2013 to 2017 was brought to you by the same corporations that are on Henry's Accelerate SC task force. And if that's not enough to blow your mind, you know, we, we'll keep doing it. So that's an example of taking that from beginning to the end in just one arena that we've been working in. Um, Robert, say something and let me collect my thoughts. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned this because a lot of what we're talking about this evening is the fact that we really want you guys to think about why you're doing this. And I think what Rhett described is, is more the how of you organize. And what you heard there is that organizing, going back to what Dr. King said about the drum major instinct and then going forward to what Brett mentioned, with what he's been working on over these last few years, a lot of what is involved in organizing is, for lack of a better way to put this, incredibly unsexy. As in, it doesn't get you on television, it doesn't get you in the headlines, Daniel, why are you, why are you giving me a thumbs up for saying that? But anyway, in all seriousness, a lot of organizing is the day-to-day -day grunt work of keeping yourself motivated, keeping yourself energized. But at the same time, organizing also provides a way for you to think of yourself differently, that you're, you're not simply seeing yourself as a cog in the machine. You're just going to work every day, just trying to get by and so forth. You're also thinking of yourself as a citizen, a, a citizen in every sense of the word, as someone who is deeply engaged with the world around you. Now, I mention this because the history of organizing in the United States often involves people getting others to think of themselves as being something greater than what society tells them they are. Um, I want to cite two very specific examples because I think we've talked about this a little bit with the history, but I want to come back to just a couple of quick examples of this history. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for just a couple of minutes because these are people um, that we've talked about before. Um, but uh, certainly, um, well, we'll do that later. But I think one person that I, I want to bring up right now who I've mentioned is a woman named Ella Baker. Now, Ella Baker was an organizer, a strategist of the civil rights movement from the 1940s through the 1960s and 70s. Uh, she was involved with every facet of the movement you can imagine. She, she started out in NAACP, later moved on to help found the Student, uh, student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1960, and really stayed active in a wide range of movements. But for Baker, her biggest idea, and perhaps the most important idea that she contributed to the movement was this sense that you don't want movements that are led by top-down organizations. You don't want to depend on a charismatic leader. You don't want to depend on someone who is the chosen one, so to speak, and everyone else simply get in line. Instead of for Ella Baker, her idea was that everyone could be a leader in his or her own way. This was really important in the 1940s, for instance. Uh, she got the NAACP to recruit tens of thousands of new members across the country who had never had any interest in serving NAACP in their lives. Because up to that point, a lot of folks thought NAACP as being more of a group for middle class Blacks and white progressive allies. Ella Baker was able to get thousands upon thousands of working class African Americans in the organization, and she lived up to them on a uh, town by town, city by city, state by state basis to figure out, okay, what are your personal material and cultural and social interests? So for instance, Baker was a big believer in the NAACP being somewhat hands off with local organizations saying, what are you trying to fight for in Orangeburg, South Carolina, or in Augusta, Georgia, or in Beaumont, Texas, or in Oakland, California, so on and so forth. She wanted it to be an organization that reflected the people that were actually in it, as opposed to simply giving orders from their headquarters in New York. 
you think about other organizers in, in American history, you think about other campaigns and movements, many of them, again, involve this idea of not simply organizing people for a common cause, but also really thinking about what is your end goal? What is your dream of outcome going to be? Now, Dr. King often spoke of what he called the beloved community, this idea that we could create a, a, a better, more loving, more peaceful, more tolerant community of people where we could finally settle these differences of militarism, racism, imperialism, and so forth. But that was integral to his organizing vision. Uh, if you don't have a vision for what society is going to look like when you're theoretically done organizing, then it's really difficult to actually organize. Um, as Brett pointed out, and as you can see on the website, if you have it up already, um, with the organizer training, one of the things you want to think about is, well, what are my actual goals? What am I trying to achieve? What kind of society do I want to have at the end of the day? This was a question civil rights activists ask themselves all the time. This was a question women's rights activists ask themselves all the time. This was a question certainly raised a great deal at the height of the anti-war movement in the 1960s and 70s. This was raised by abolitionists in the 19th century and so forth. The thing about organizing is that it's not simply about getting people together and saying, let's, it's not simply about getting people together and saying, do this. Uh, it's about getting people together and saying, what do we want? What can we achieve and how do we achieve that? Certainly folks like Ella Baker in the 1940s and 50s understood the importance of that. Um, you want to really think about what organizing looks like for you, um, not just in terms of a group of people, but personal, because really what we're asking to do is not just prepare to organize people, we're also asking each and every one of you to look inward and to reflect on, well, how can I reflect personally the kind of society I want to create as well? Any questions or comments before we move on? Well, Robert, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make a comment. Um, thank you for that. And Ella Baker, <clears throat> really interesting gap in the history there between the Southern Negro Youth Congress and the, South, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that we spoke about back in the past. But uh, I wanted to bring up another example of how we looked at something that is just a total front burner issue right now and has been, should have been for, for the last couple hundred years is, um, racism and that and how we in the original formulation of the of the network that was the that was the big debate in the first meeting about can we prioritize that which it is that's the most significant issue and we did come out of there with racism being the most significant issue and uh, we also came out of there with uh, having our net cast wide enough to be able to engage um, everyone in it including uh, an emerging gay movement um, that at a time there was still the the link, not not just lingering, but the traumatic drama of having uh, a political force in South Carolina that had taken the House in the governor's race uh, on the on the assertion that AIDS was a uh, a punishment of God for homosexuality, and so in incorporating the racial element in there. Um, we talked for a good while, not just that meeting, but for the, like the next couple of years, was that how do you actually organize around that? I mean, we, we all went to Sunday school, we know it's wrong, you know, it's the bread and yellow, black and white and all that stuff. What do you do? How do you take a bite out of something that's so big and so deeply woven? And came up with looking at criminal justice statistics because it's measurable. We literally have a body count. And um, we did a, an analysis of the criminal justice system in South Carolina, and it was just rather alarming and shocking and uh, that it was the worst we could find, period, anywhere. 10% of the entire black population being arrested every year. Um, and that wasn't counting the babies and the old, really old people. And narrowing down on a, like a 16 to maybe 35-year-old age group, it's only half the people in that age group being involved in the criminal justice system in some way. And so in 2000, we started doing um, 
interviews, and we did we did one at Benedict that is in the, our book at the website under racial justice or racial profiling uh, under projects. And so, when we're doing looking at a problem that is a, 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 a these are systemic problems or system wide, we want to do it in such a fashion as that we look at ways to deal with the cause. We can look at the symptoms as ways to teach people about the cause. We also want to empower people to be able to strike at the cause. And so we're doing this as a project that will be people can use as a tool. So we also want to involve the people in shaping that. We did town hall meetings on is racial profiling a problem? We knew it was a problem, but it was a forum that gave people a chance to really come and talk about it. And we had standing room only crowds in the block building, the government building where the House of Representatives meet, with uh, Ernest Finney, the Black Supreme Court Justice, and Representative Neal, and I can't remember who else was there, so I think Leon Lott might have been there, Sheriff of Richmond County. And um, there were just incredible stories about mothers uh, fearing for their children or being in the back seat when the cop stops them. Um, the stories, we had a, a sled agent who didn't testify in person, but submitted testimony about being stopped. And, he was in an unmarked car when the policeman walked up to the window and looked inside and he saw a shotgun and a radio. He said, oh, are you law enforcement? And the sled agent said, yes. And the black sled agent said, yes. And the cop said, well, I'm sorry. And turned around and walked off. And uh, McKinley Weaver, the first black sled agent said, what if I won the cop? What would have happened? And so these were testimonies that, that really kind of galvanized the crowd, inspired some of the political leaders and got incredible media, both here and in North Charleston, which is a place that really needs to have some racial justice. From that and from the surveys we did about people being stopped for no reason, we wrote a bill uh, to, it was called the Police Stop Statistic Act, which is a, a kind of an academic way of saying a bill to mitigate racial profiling. Knowing we couldn't stop it, but knowing that if you tracked it, it would, in, it would empower people to be able to deal with it and understand it. And we introduced that bill in 2000. It didn't pass until 2006 when it was, it was mandatory that all states have a mandatory seatbelt bill or they were going to lose all their federal highway money. And we were like the last state. And they were going to let the government get between our heads and our windshield. Sanford vetoed the bill and the Republicans needed uh, votes to override it. And uh, they went to the Black Caucus and ask what do you want to sign on to this? They said the seat bill, the racial profiling bill. And so the bill we thought passed, that was like something that we had prepared. This is a strategic approach to making change. Something we prepared, studied, organized, worked on with the hope that we would have the opportunity to be able to push it down the road some. And so that refusal to pass the seatbelt bill was that opportunity. That law, that bill became law in 2006, watered down by five white men in conference committee who changed it from all cops report all stops to all cops report warning tickets. And so now we have a toolkit on our website that has every police agency in South Carolina that can arrest somebody or, or issue a ticket has to report every month the race, gender, and age of people that they have public contact with that they don't arrest. And just that database that no matter where you live in South Carolina, if you wanted to be engaged in taking a bite out of racism and empowering your community, you use that little toolkit and you follow the directions or the, you know, the suggestions and you would make an appointment to go talk to the cops, your cops. And you say, well, you know, we've looked at your record and you know, you're not even complying. Can you tell us why and what can we do to get you to do this? And that they may be complying. And they may be indicating that, like in Mount Pleasant, you're six times as likely to be stopped if you're black as if you're white. And say, yo, this is wrong. What can we do? It? So what, it, it doesn't solve the problem, but it empowers people to do things. And the few places that we've been able to get people to do those, the people were like really enthusiastic about just their ability to walk into a police station, have a meeting with a sheriff, the chief of police, and talk about this. And they like, wow, citizens have power if they get organized. That's a really, that's a really nice 
thing to be able to suggest to people and give them a way to break the ice that they open that door and confront the authorities that they're going to have to deal with. And uh, they're, you know, they're, that tool is just sitting there because we haven't had the capacity, the money, the staff, et cetera, to be able to help people find it and use it and all. And again, as, as Professor Green suggested, that maybe it's not sexy enough. But that's an example of a tool that we've been using and rolling down the road for, this is now, Lord of mercy, that's 20 years ago we started on this. And so that, that idea of making change, we've maybe noticed that racism is still amongst us and that it's going to be here for a while and we've got to get really smart and strategic about ways to do it, ways to educate people, ways to organize people to be able to different, differentiate a protest that is a reaction to a circumstance as opposed to a, a protest that may be a reaction to a circumstance, but it's tied to an organized effort that recognizes the, the cause of the symptom that you're reacting to. So when your protest leverages something that's a plan, the protest is much more effective. I can use an example for that, that we believe since the inception of the network that healthcare should be a right of citizenship. The only advanced industrial democracy that doesn't have healthcare as a citizenship right, part, part of what you get. We get more nuclear weapons than anybody in the world, but we don't get healthcare. And so this is something that obviously we're swimming up a swift stream because it's one of, if, other than I think other than the military, it's, it's the largest expenditure, uh, the gross expenditure in the, in the United States is healthcare. And uh, we supported um, the Medicaid expansion that was passed in 2013 and that Nikki Haley was governor and she didn't just say no to Medicaid expansion. She said, never. I mean, our people don't want you federal government having your laws get between them and their doctors. And um, we had 235,000 people, I think. We had the names of those people that didn't have health care. <laughs> they didn't have any money. And they were in that that demographic that would have gotten a free Medicaid card. And that the other demographic, slightly richer at 130% of the poverty level, could buy into a subsidized insurance plan. So basically the Affordable Care Act wasn't healthcare, it was an insurance subsidy plan because we can't quite get healthcare for all passed. And Obama made the, the, the strategic decision on his part that we wouldn't do what Ms. Clinton tried to do uh, when she was working with her husband, and they tried to do uh, a health care for all thing. It didn't work. And uh, Nikki refused, and the, the Democratic Party in this state, uh, the leadership of that party, was really, really hesitant about raising the issue of the people that didn't get health care. And so we were trying to force the issue. And we did all kind of research and brought in, we did a rally the day they opened the legislature in 2014. That was the year they were supposed to debate it. They just had passed it in 2013. It was already real clear the governor wanted to sign it. Republicans said, we're not going to talk about it. Republicans are the dominant party. And the talking heads in the newspapers and television said, we're not going to talk about it. We made them talk about it. We, we, we really did. And uh, we did that by protesting and raising hell and education. But um, we have a video that you can go to our blog and type in Medicaid expansion and watch us mob the lobby. Uh, hundred plus people with t-shirts on being really obnoxious. And uh, the um, 39 people arrested, some of them more than once in uh, three different instances of blocking the entrance to the state house over that issue. Uh, old people, young people, medical people, black people, white people. And uh, so we were making news in educating people to the abject amorality of the people that are running our government. The chief of police that arrested us, he said, if y'all hadn't done this, I, ha I would have had no idea that we turned down free medical care for 4,000 homeless people in Colombia, that the police are the only people that have to deal with them, but we, we can't, we're not social workers. Why did we do that? And so that, some of the things that happen here, uh, actually a lot of the things that happen here, because of the culture, are just incomprehensible to people. They, they have no idea that we've done things like this, that we turned down free health care that not only was a bad idea at the time, but God forbid you have like a pandemic 
and that you've created a pool of people, quarter million people, that don't have not only you know, they don't have insurance, they don't have health care, and, and they go back to hospitals that don't have the three hundred and fifty million dollars a year they're losing because the Affordable Care Act took their indigent care money away from them because all the poor people got Medicaid cards, except in South Carolina and the other states run by some crazy Republicans. So the, the way that the, 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 that you have to organize these politics to be, have a sense of what it is that the people feel and what, how they're being abused and what they don't know and who's doing it and all is evidenced by some of these plans that end up with our programmatic approach to being able to know the people in the counties, in the precincts that don't have a Medicaid card, that were, that were screwed by the governor, and that we, we have in our C4 capacity. Now, all this policy work is nonpartisan C3 stuff we can take grant money for. You as individuals should all be members of our C4 that can do direct political work. And so, we follow up this policy work and this educational work with a push. And we're real strategic about that because you just can't, you can't win unless you push real smart. And what we've done that nobody else is doing is actually winning elections. Um, and we win elections by doing things like targeting an audience in a political district, in a race that can be changed. Because we know which ones can be changed because we've got that data. Very few, very few. 10% of the races in South Carolina, it's possible to change the party. You can change the, you can change the name of the person sitting in the seat. In the Democratic Party, you can change the color of some of the people sitting in the seat. But you're really unlikely to change the party that controls the seat, which means you can't change the outcome of politics. And so, but we can pick the ones where we can, we can do something, like target a black Republican that it, no, it was a black, uh, was a, it was a, it was a, I can't remember who we targeted. In a Berkeley County race in 2018, the incumbent uh, was against Medicaid expansion. And um, yeah, it was, it was the only black Republican in the house. And we were able to do a mailing, a direct mailing to over 5,000 people in that political district about the fact that their incumbent denied them health care. And we knew they didn't have health care because we had that data. And the Democratic opponent didn't even know we did it. He didn't know we did it until after he won narrowly. I think it was 170 votes. And we made the direct mail. Uh, we made a robocall with Gilda and put Omari's phone number in it. And Omari, people called Omari and he talked to over 100 people. So that's the type of thing that we're doing that is smart, it's not grandstanding, and it works. And it works because of all the stuff we've done over the years to understand the problem, understand the cause of the problem, the symptoms of the problem, identify the impact of people, engage them, and move a plan. Uh, if we could do it in a large fashion, we could actually make some real change here. I'm going to pause there and take any questions or observations and let uh, Dr. Green speak. Did Todd join us yet? Yes, he has just joined us. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Yes, and uh, what we've been doing is talking a bit about the ideas behind organizing. Uh, Brett's really drilled home the idea behind really knowing what you're organizing for, what's pushing your organizing. I've added a bit in terms of histories behind ideas of organizing and organizing theory, like Ella Baker and her idea of uh, participatory democracy and so forth. Um, one thing I'd like to do right now, speaking of that, that tradition of participatory democracy, is I wanted to hear from a few of you and, and basically to answer this one question, what is motivating you to get involved in organizing? Is it a particular cause, several causes? Is it, is it a feeling about society headed in the wrong direction? I'm curious to learn what some of you guys are, what's motivating you to actually learn what it means to be an organizer because it can be different reasons uh, for different people. Anyone can go first. Uh, you know, don't don't be shy, please. Don't don't be scared, as the kids say. Yeah, I'll go well, on the school. Um, I was I've been thinking about all the conversation <clears throat> that we just had, and prior to this meeting, 
I've also, I was speaking to a friend the other day. I was coming from the, uh, it was after a dental appointment. And um, I, I called the dentist, he took me right away. And I went to the drugstore, got a prescription filled within 15 minutes. And this friend that I was talking to, I've known since uh, I was in high school. And I explained to her, she was my English teacher, so I've known her for 50 years, how I almost wept because I thought about all the people that didn't have health care, that couldn't go to the dentist, that couldn't go to the pharmacy and get their prescription filled within 15 minutes. And um, I guess that's part of the motivation for me being here and as I recall to her, um, I went to my first demonstration for fair housing when I was 16 years old. And it was with a Catholic priest that was one of my teachers. And as I thought about it, and I think back to some of the things that Brett had talked about during the 60s, when a lot of you guys weren't even born, <laughs> and I'm approaching 70 years old, that I saw a lot of this stuff and there's something that keeps me coming back. And um, I don't wanna talk too long on this or sound like, you know, I've been on the forefront and fire hoses and all that stuff, but I've seen a few things and I've seen a few things change. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a uh, legislative representative for AARP when I was in Michigan and they sent me to Washington lobby Washington to lobby our senators and representatives for the Health Care Act. So after I thought about it, you know, I said, you know, 50 years has shot by real fast. And I, I'm not tired. I want to see things done. Because I know how it feels when they're not done. I've been on food stamps at one, to one time in my life. I've been on, uh, you know, like a Medicaid. Um, so I know what it's like. And it doesn't feel good. And I know what it's like to not have those worries, and that feels a lot better. And uh, I guess all that being said, to make a long story short, a lot of times it has shot by, and oh, by the way, I was in Washington in 1969, I think it was September, for the Vietnam War protest. So I guess I'm a little older than I think I am, but I still feel like I'm 18. So at any rate, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, and that gives you a little bit more background as to why I'm here and still crazy after all these years. So that's it. Uh, fantastic. Thank you for that. I mean, that's certainly uh, really, I think, really informative in terms of not only how long you've been involved, but as you pointed out, how you still want to come back and do more. Exactly. I think that, that's a big part of organizing, too, is the sense that you, you, you have the energy to keep coming back. It still feels like we got not only work to, to be done, but mm -hmm. work that we have done a as a nation, as concerned people. So even though progress comes a lot of times, very little at a time, it's still progress. Definitely. Thanks Definitely. for listening. Thank you. All right. Who wants to go next? I know we had a few volunteers at the very, very get-go wants to volunteer their words about why they're interested in organizing and what really energizes them to get involved in activism and organizing. I'll go if nobody else is up. So. Please go right ahead, Omari. Yeah, for me, um, it's funny, I was just in a, an anti-racism workshop a little earlier and one of the segments was a personal timeline and my timeline I started it from um from 73 when I was born and I think I was born on like the last day of um when they were bombing the north in Vietnam and um I didn't really learn about Nam until you know, 20 years later. So I didn't really go back to Nam until Desert Storm and then trying to, trying to just understand uh, international politics and um, 
why we only go to war with you know brown colored countries now and just all this this kind of stuff but um on my timeline I, I started it with that um i put it in the middle in 77 when i was a kid they had a it was a big blackout in new york and it was like basically it was like a lot of looting and um i was thinking about the looting um compared to today and just the motivations of it and all that but the the pressure in new york was um way different than from sanitation strikes to open air heroin markets you know police on strike garbage workers on strike and then where i'm from in the bronx um the buildings would get you know torched by landlords you know so they could rack up on uh, in insurance so fast forward to 80 and Reagan comes in. I didn't really understand. I was seven or eight in 1980. I forgot how old I was. But um, uh, I didn't understand the correlation between like all the social unrest and like programs being cut in the presidency. I, I couldn't see, he called it trickle down economics, but I couldn't see the trickle down policy of like, you know, the social cuts and things like that. My mom was a social worker. So I could so I could just kind of like listen to her war stories and know something something was awry. And then 84 um crack hit. And that just changed like good neighborhoods in New York City. So long story short, um what got me into organizing was in the late eighties, hip hop started responding to the crack era. And that was like my favorite time in hip hop because it's where I learned black history and, you know, things like that. So once we got to the Rodney King riots in 92, um, that's when the consciousness out of the music stopped. So I didn't have like an organizing tool, which was my art form to really be an organizer for. So basically, um, looking back now and understanding um, the crack laws in the 80s and like, you know, 50 times, you know, for a small thing of crack versus, you know, kilos or, you know, whatever cocaine possession and seeing the disparities of that and then how that knocked off a lot of black men and just, you know, screwed up black people in general with all the the drugs that were being put in the um, country because I didn't understand the Iran Contra hearings until uh, I learned about the Dark Alliance and how the United States was, you know, financing through basically genocide, you know, through putting drugs in a, in a black community. So I kind of meandered through organizing the rest of my 20s and until my 30s. And um, I was about 40 when uh, Trayvon Martin got murdered. And when Black Lives Matter came along, I thought that that was the, that would be like my civil rights era. And I still think it can be, especially this year and, you know, the last month of social unrest. But organizing wise, what, um, what I learned from it is first you got to know uh, the level of w which you're fighting from and what you're fighting for. So I think that there's some people who fight because it's a war of attrition. They understand the long game. So whether it's a 1955 bus boycott or, you know, whatever, or Colin Kaepernick, you know, now he's being proven right now. It's, it's a longer struggle than just, just your immediate reaction to a moment. So people understand the attrition that comes with that. And then the other thing I learned is that um, people fight, they like they're looking for catharsis from being muted all the time. So I think there are a lot of people in the movement who they just want to be heard and they almost find the, the end all be all of organizing and just being heard and you know being able to scream out. And um, the third level of organizing, which is what I really appreciate about the network, is fighting to win, you know, and picking battles that you can win, 
But then getting to that point of war of attrition, there's, I think Brett said it the other, on one of the other calls where you still take smaller wins or smaller gains from whatever campaign you engage in. So you may not have the total outcome of what you were seeking, but the process of fighting that war, you know, you pick up little small victories or you gain membership or just other jewels that you can extract um, from your work. So it's not just a, you know, an effort exercise and futility. Um, being on the ground, you know, I always say power map the assets. So I think I've learned to not only power map assets of like who got skill sets or who has the resources or where the toolboxes are. Um, there's also a matter of, how do you say, uh, being able to, so like, like the things that we might go over in class, like I think everybody knows how to kick it in the language of their community. So like Dr. Green, you might be kicking it a certain way in class and we might break bread and, and on a lesson in, um, in the, from the paper and in, in the dialogue of the class. When I come to Orangeburg or I'm in North Columbia or wherever I am, I'm going to know the terrain and the politics and the, the tone or, you know, do I need to sound professorial and academic in this environment? You know, do I need to talk a little more every day, you know, and um, just little little nuances and getting people educated on what it is um, they're fighting for and uh, to give them clarity on it. Because I think a lot of people know that something isn't right, but they just may not be clear about what's not right about it. So I think what we can be is those those translators to make it very plain and crystal clear. Okay, like this is what's happening to to turn a statistics and say X amount of voters and be able to turn that into a narrative, into a way that people can understand it. And then we gotta have other people who can turn tasks into very granular things, who can pinch off the work. Um, in a in a way where people feel involved in the movement, but there are levels to the movement. So like not everybody is going to be on the education side, but you might have foot soldiers that will show up to the rally. Not everybody wants to be a foot soldier at the rally, but you might have somebody who can table and make sure the names or whatever, or the person who can get the the voting um registration and you know upload it or just whatever it is but i think that's what people are looking for um from organizations like us is they're looking for like very they're looking for a safe space to chisel out their ideas so like a place where you can break bread and figure it out but also i think people want very clear strategy on like oh this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it and then i think the relationship building comes when you make the space um, to deeply listen to people to, um, to, to the earlier point of like, okay, so this unrest is in the street, then how do we tie that into a policy or, or, or legislation that's already on the book? So maybe we need to add it to it or a resolution or whatever it is and how we translate that into a structural transformation. And then, you know, just having the IQ on how long that battle is gonna take and I'll just close with, I think whoever other is, whether we want to say it's a Republican, a Democrat, or a racist, or this or that, um, I think their art of war is basically waiting until we're, until we're tired and giving up. So A1 is we can't um, give up. And B, I think we, we have a lot of traumatized people so at some point, a lot of the organizing devolves into attacking each other. And like, you know, I track a lot of the conversations now about like, this needs to be a black space. And you know, why are the white people speaking up? Or people say, as a white person, I want to be involved in this and that. And um, what I appreciate, the, the, the example I'll close with is, uh, Fred Hampton and the Young Patriots, and which is why I think Fred Hampton was so dangerous, is because he basically collaborated with other marginalized, you know, white folks, 
and that's where they saw their common humanity. So they kind of fought for the same things, but the nuances were different. But the young Patriots and the Panthers out of Chicago, which um, Fred Hampton was leading, he understood that. And to me, that's probably the point where he became most dangerous because he had white folks buying into a different paradigm that wasn't consistent with, you know, the larger structure of racism. So kind of like Malcolm coming back from Mecca and kind of like King thinking about redistribution of wealth, he pushed the button to COINTELPRO and, you know, Hoover, that was a little bit too much. So, you know, they had to make a move. And I'll just close there. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Amari. I really appreciate that because it, it, like both of you have already made these great points about how there are so many moving parts when it comes to organizing and, and being involved in activism. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Fred Hampton. I was trying to find the video. There used to be a video on YouTube that I used to use in my classes where one of Hampton's lieutenants in the Black Panther Party in Chicago went to go meet with the Young Patriots. Um, in Chicago. And the thing about the Young Patriots, for those of you who don't know, um, not only were they a, a mostly white group, but they were primarily people or the sons and daughters of people who had moved from Appalachia to Chicago. And in this video, you actually see this Black Panther member who is dressed in all black with the beret and everything. But he's talking to these people and he's asking them, what can we do for you? And that was the first question he asked is, what can we do for you? What are some of the problems you're facing? And whenever I show this video, when I used to teach at USC, especially I enjoy showing this video because these are white people who were telling this member of the Black Panther Party after they established some trust in the two groups, they tell him our problems are police brutality. Our problems are living in poor conditions. Our problems are dealing with rats in our apartments. Things that he quickly said, hey, these are the exact same issues we're having on the south side of Chicago. And so a, a lot of this organizing that we're talking about is trying to find common ground, trying to figure out what it is that has brought you to this place where you have to organize. And by the way, in the comments, I'm glad Cecil's pointing this out. Um, there's a great documentary about the Black Panthers, Vanguard Revolution. You can watch on PBS right now. Uh, well, don't do it right now, but as soon as we're done, you should go ahead and check it out. Um, but again, these are the kinds of stories that I think are incredibly important. Um, I, I can tell you just very quickly, I'll tell my own story of, of activism being involved in protesting. Um, as a kid, of course, I loved history and I was always intrigued by the history of the civil rights movement. Uh, it was something that my parents grew up with, something that I always read about in history books, I saw on television via eyes on the prize and so forth. But as I got older, the 1990s, I was a teenager by about 2000, I was aware of people like Sean Bell and Amadou Diallo, people who were shot and killed by the New York Police Department. Um, as we got into the 21st century, we had the war in Iraq, we had, um, you had Hurricane Katrina, you had these things that really pushed me to think harder about what kind of society I lived in and whether or not it was the kind of society I wanted to continue living in. And then coming into adulthood, I had the, um, well, going to graduate school, I had the financial crisis, 2007, 2008. You had the election of Barack Obama, Occupy Wall Street, the rise of the Tea Party. Um, all of these things that really forced me to realize, well, the world I thought I lived in is a lot more complicated than I, than I believed it was. But for me, I think the, the most important moment that really pushed me to, to think hard about activism it was twofold. Both occurred in 2013. One, of course, was what happened to Trayvon Martin and being killed by George Zimmerman, and more importantly, the verdict that, that found Zimmerman not guilty of murdering Trayvon Martin. I can still remember where I was in my apartment that night the verdict was announced, and it felt like a literal punch to the gut as in I fell back on my couch when the, the verdict was announced. But then another thing that galvanized me was around that same time, I was reading an article in Mother Jones Magazine. And it was talking about how 
uh, the food industry had essentially gotten away with putting a ton of different chemicals and processing products in their food and how thousands if not millions of Americans were developing severe health maladies because these things were going either unreported or underreported. And the first thing I thought about, the first person I thought about rather was my father, who is a big strong man, still is to this day, was in the US Army, uh, was a sheriff's deputy for a while, now drives trucks, but he also suffers from uh, type two diabetes, just like I do actually. And he always talked about the fact that he felt it was because of all the crap he ate in the army and the, the, the things being put in our food. And I read this article and I realized both how powerless I felt at that moment, realizing that I literally did not have control of what was being put in my body. But I also felt powerful because then I thought, well, wait, there are other folks who are reading this article. There are other folks who are sharing in the struggle. If I can find a way to link up with them, if I can reach out to them, get involved in this greater fight, this greater battle to make a better society, then maybe I can make a difference after all. Part of organizing, and I think what everyone who's spoken here tonight has really talked about, is above all else, not giving in to a sense of despair. Realizing that, yeah, the fight is, is a long fight. Um, as Dr. King said, I may not get there with you. It, it may be a fight that lasts generation after generation after generation. Um, like last class, I pointed out how police brutality gets mentioned in Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Before that, in the 1920s and 30s, you have folks protesting against police brutality. A lot of the issues we're talking about in this class, a lot of the issues you're seeing play out in the streets of America right now are issues that have been around for an incredibly long time. That does not mean that we should give up on trying to fight to, to better our society, to better ourselves, and to really make headway on these issues. On the contrary, it should give us some hope, not, not like an unqualified sentimental hope that everything is gonna just be all right. No, it doesn't quite work out like that. But things can get better if we, again, work together to push society in a much better direction. Now I'm gonna stop pontificating again. Uh, and, and I wanna hear, um, I, actually I wanna hear especially from Dr. Shaw, cause I know you come at this from a more poli sci angle um, in terms of organizing. A lot of your research, if memory serves, deals with this intersection of organizing and politics in Detroit. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, Robert. And, and I, I, I do intend um, to, to, to be brief, um, I do intend. <laughs> That's my intention. Um, so I, I would say that, um, so um, Dr. Green was referencing a book that was published in 2009 by Duke University Press entitled Now is the Time, uh, Detroit Black Politics and Grassroots Activism. And in that book, I was intrigued by what I saw in the city of Detroit. I fell in love with the city of Detroit and the history, I should say, really of the African-American community in Detroit. Because when I began, the, when I studied more about that community, um, interacted with it, I have family in, who, who have lived there for many, uh, for a couple of decades. Um, and, I went, and I was a student at the University of Michigan in Ar Ann Arbor, so we weren't that far from Detroit, you know, about a 40 minute uh, car ride. And so as I learned more about it, it, it said to me, I said, Detroit is an interesting lens to understand this overall question of grassroots activism or to, to revisit the whole uh, article by Bayard Rustin about from protest to politics. And I'd always been intrigued as a student of political science and of African American studies about this whole question of, well, but wasn't there, wasn't there a, a, a hand in glove relationship between activism, grassroots activism and what we call sort of politics or electoral you know, politics and, and, and my, my, my conclusion was yes. And, and so I began to, to look at this question around grassroots activism on housing questions, whether it be homelessness, uh, um, activism within public housing or community development organizations. Three very different spheres of activism, but all sort of were uh, for me a very important and neat window into uh, understanding when 
effectively the, the question I ask in that book is, uh, when does protest matter? When is, when is protest effective? And I began to study the, the uh, literature around political opportunity structures, what, what's required uh, in order for these windows to open up. Uh, and so it gave me, from, from an intellectual scholarly standpoint, some insights about the various movements that I as a student and then into my, more into my older adult life have gotten involved in from the, the uh, Free South Africa movement when I was a student at Howard University um, to activism on the campus at University of Michigan uh, to you know, elements of my activism here in the uh, Columbia uh, community from things you know, uh, on campus certainly in university politics to my involvement in, in uh, LGBTQ civil rights here in the state. So it, 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 it began to, I ha had a, at least some uh, intersection between my intellectual self and knowledge and my citizen self. And so that's why in whatever ways I feel I can be a scholar citizen, I, I'm charged to do that. Um, and yeah, so I would say my, my window into and my connection with the with the network, uh, Brett and I have been talking for probably a couple of years and, and Brett sort of finally said, you know, Shaw's now's the time uh, to kind of come on in. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm very ha happy to have joined you uh, with, with the class and um, and and and, uh, and 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 hopefully make some contributions to our, to our conversation. Uh, I also teach a class uh, that I created uh, at USC called Black Act Activism, um, and really my my purpose in that class. Uh, and I I told my students it can't be an ulterior motive because I'm saying it out loud, is for you to understand what does it mean to be a grassroots activist um, and. Uh, one of the individuals among some who've also been connected with the network with uh, Robert Burgess took that, cl uh, that class as one of my students and I know he's been involved with the network um, and there are probably some other names as well, but um, I really did want to foment some activism among students on campus through that class. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for that. I, again, this, this kind of shows how organizing for a lot of us intersects with with our day-to-day -day jobs and has inspired us to, to do what we're doing right now. Um, now, before we move on, does anyone else want to talk about what has pushed them to activism? In particular, I'd like to hear from some of the women who are in tonight's class, um, because as, as Brett mentioned earlier, right, we're, we're we're dealing with a society that can oppress you in multiple ways. You know, we have this term for that intersectionality, but certainly being a woman involved in activism means really having to address all of these issues and fighting, fighting against racism, but also having reasons to fight against sexism, not just in society, but even within activist circles, right? So again, you know, I want to hear from folks uh, before we move on, because we do also want to talk a bit tonight about tactics as well, and, and really how we achieve some of these goals of what Brett calls um, a pragmatic radicalism. Does anybody else want to mention their own reasons for being involved in activism? I'll go. Please um, go right ahead. I'll be short. Um, thank you. I I think that um, probably the tipping point for me is um, after the Emanuel Nine massacre. I probably. Um, certainly naively and of my own privilege never was like, oh, you know, I think that maybe this will all die out and I'll, you know, once all these older racists go away, it will be okay. Um, and that really lit a fire under me to be like, wait a second, I, this guy is younger than I am. This is way deeper than I ever thought. This, I'm, I'm responsible now. I, I need to be doing something. Um, because that was just ridiculous and felt like a fool after all of that once you start learning and um, how deep it really goes. Um, so I, that was probably the tipping point for me and in, in getting involved in just learning. And I do think that um, having the opportunity to be in this class and listen to so many, I mean, just so many different things and perspectives and history is something, because again, 
it's shameful that I didn't learn any of this growing up. I mean, it's, it's, a, it would be a much different, um, it would be much easier for any activism <laughs> to, to get much more traction if people knew, and if they knew it all along and knew it their entire life, instead of having to crash course learn it at some point when they decide that something doesn't feel right. So um, I think that that that's where I'm at. I think from, you know, people are, I still feel very overwhelmed by where I should be in this and, and where, what's my place in it and um, how I can make a difference. I feel like I'm very, again, I've, I'm a very privileged person. I feel like a, a lot of it I don't belong in because I don't want to step on any other voices, but I, um, I am comfortable in the housing market, in the housing industry because that's what I do day to day. So that's what I'm comfortable talking about. And that's what I'm comfortable in that context. Um, I also know that I, in the position that I'm in, I have the ability, I, I just technic from a technical standpoint, I, I look at all the screenings for anybody that comes to our apartment community. So I make the decisions as to whether or not they are approved to move in and with what type of deposit and that sort of thing. And so I think about this all the time. And am I being fair? Am I being fair just basing it on a judgment of, you know, their credit qualifications on their name, on their, um, you know, certain histories, if they have charge offs because of medical history, that sort of thing. Am I being fair? Um, and I feel like I've learned a lot through that and I have as fair as I can possibly be. But it's because I think about it every day. I have to think about it every single day. And I know there's a lot of people that do something in a similar position that I'm in that, that probably don't think that way and it would create an inherently unjust system for housing, which is how could you argue that somebody needs housing to live in? And we even went to a, you know, we try to stay involved with our local organization and apartment association and they do a fair housing, I don't know, symposium kind of thing. And it would amaze you or maybe not the things that people ask in the fair housing like demonstration as to like what they are and aren't allowed to do related to race in fair housing. Like there, it's, it's again, there's these microaggressions or whatever they are. I know they happen every single day. They happen across Columbia and South Carolina and the country. And that's where I feel like if I can carve out kind of this piece that makes sense and something that I can try to articulate well and try to understand a lot better and put it in a context with the people around me and the people in my organization and maybe the apartment association, that's where I feel like I can start. <laughs> and that gives me a place in the moment and then that can maybe trickle down into other things. But um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So that's, that's just my little, little bit as to how I feel I should be engaged and where I can go from here. Thank you so much for that, Julie. That's great. Again, this is, this is really what we want to talk about tonight in terms of what's pushing to get involved in activism. Dr. Hale, I know you had some of that as well. Yeah. And thanks for um, sharing the space. I just wanted to add and, and share that. Uh, well, for me personally, I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, like, Dr. Green and Dr. Shaw to, to study activism as a student and to almost research it, right? Because it's such an um, active compon component of social and political movements to study it. But then once you interact with it personally on the ground, it's quite different. And that happened for me um, after writing a dissertation about Mississippi civil rights movement in the 60s, specifically with, about the Freedom Schools moving to Charleston in 2011 in meeting Dave Dennis, who was a core uh, Congress of Racial Equality uh, organizer in 19, in, uh, beginning in 1961. And today he is a founding member of the Algebra Project along with Bob Moses. And I really understood the movement so much more after working with Dave and I'm now on the board with the Algebra Project with him and, and kind of following him for these past nine years is that organizing to me, um, was definitely not the protests and the marches and carrying the signs. And, you know, I, I do that on occasion and participate and, and, and lend support where I can, but it's, it's spaces like the Majeska Simkin School, it's spaces like the Freedom Schools and Liberation Schools and the spaces that people create to educate themselves and to sort of check in with one another and to learn and to share, you know, theory, whether it's political organizing, whether it's just straight political theory, 
um, how we um, interact with others or how we should interact to, to push the movement forward. And that is that is that educative component that really lit a fire under me. And this sort of crystallized in uh, Charleston, you know, Julie was talking about the AME and we're about to uh, remember, you know, the fifth anniversary, which is on Wednesday. But it was, people forget, I mean, Emmanuel AME happened. And that was just, it was less than three months after Walter Scott, after Mike, Michael Slager shot, shot Walter Scott um, multiple times in the back. So Charleston was already reeling from that and then Emmanuel happened. So um, I remember sitting on the uh, steps of the North Charleston City Hall, which is where a lot of the organizing was taking place after Walter Scott. And then after AME, of course, too. But, you know, Moya Dean DeBaja, uh, who's since passed, uh, and Darren Calhoun, who works at Avery Research Center, were organizing a freedom school on the steps of uh, North Charleston City Hall. And just sort of struck me that, you know, the sun was setting, people were going home, the, all the excitement, you know, I think the first time protesters had died down. But to me, that was, that was the conversation. Uh, that really defined what activism was. And every time, you know, after every class, um, Brett is my, you know, kids are screaming at 8.30 and Brett says, you know, now let's continue the conversation because there's a lot of people who want to talk. That's where activism is. It's, it's, it's in these spaces where we can sort of meet, right? Before we go back out to the streets or before we try to um, bring others into this movement. And to me, organizing is like, what do you do in between the protest. What do you do when you put down the sign and you're marching? Like, what 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 are we doing with our schools? Like Dr. Shaw, are we are we teaching in our classrooms to directly inspire kids? Um, and if not, why not? But I mean, you know, it's a sort of to me, it's this educative component, and that's why I was so intrigued to finally have a chance to join this class. Was that because this fits again? I've said this before into the larger trajectory of the long freedom struggle, that this space here now on Zoom, how appropriate to show what this looks like in the 21st century and how it's evolving. But this is just, we're just plugging into a longer trajectory. And um, to me, that's most inspiring. And I, and I really want my students to see it's not starting a new organization and getting arrested. It can be that, and many times it has to be that. But it's also, what are we doing when, you know, Trump's tweets are getting the headlines and we're not marching, right? That, that's when we really need people to sort of get together. So just want to chime in to say that um, this is where I'm coming from um, in, in terms of activism and organizing and how I see the Majestic Simpkins model as part of a longer movement and just how critical that is once these protests start to die down, how critical it is to just keep moving forward with this type of political education. Uh, thanks so much for that. That's, those are some great points. Um, and I think really brings home a lot of what we're trying to do here in the Modesto School and also the traditions that Dr. Hill mentioned that we're working as a part of. Um, Heather, did you have your hand up a moment ago? I did. I don't know if I had my hand up. <laughs> I was going to talk. Um, so I work for Richmond Library and I've worked there for 17 years and um, I've worked at every location. So I've worked from, from Eastover to Ballantyne. So if you live in Richland County and you've been going to our library system, I've probably been your librarian at some point. But um, with that uh, opportunity, I've seen everything and anything from Richland County um, and the different communities that, that those libraries serve. I mean, you know, you've got Ballantyne, which is completely different from Eastover. You know, it's it's very white, it's very um, privileged, it's very Christian, it's very, and then you've got Eastover where people don't have access to technology, people don't have access to transportation, they don't have access to employment. And so a lot of activism for me has been things that, that, that I don't, I can't um, identify with, that I need to be active and 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 be an activist for people who for humanity I guess is the best word to say um, you know a lot of times if I talk to someone who has a different viewpoint than I do in terms of who they voted for or what they believe it's all about them what can this politician do for me what can or, or that doesn't affect me um, you know if so and so um, voted for whatever it doesn't bother me well um i try it's not always you know it's hard to change people's point of view but um even if it doesn't affect you directly it's affecting your community it's affecting your neighbors it's affecting your 
kids, you're, you know, um, and so that's really where my activism comes from. I can't remember a time that I wasn't active. Um, and um, you specifically talked about kind of like gender. Um, so I, I, that's something I feel very strongly about. Um, feminism and such. Uh, so I volunteered pretty early on with Girls Rock Columbia. I don't know if anyone's, I don't know if you're uh, if you didn't know about that, but um, that was, that's something that's really dear to my heart is getting um, girls, women, those who identify as female to really step up and, um, and then with Girls Rock, it's not just the music part of it. It's, it's very much activism, teaching kids as young as eight, how important that is, um, how important it is to have a voice and how much your voice matters. I don't know. Most of you um, probably voted last Tuesday. I don't know if any of you rich, live in Richland County, or um, but I had a huge debacle. They gave me the wrong ballot. Um, it was something that I was I was flabbergasted by it, um, and I had to sit there for an hour before I got the correct ballot because um, men kept telling <laughs> white men kept telling me that I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, I think getting past the point of being meek and and polite is something that um, is really important for women uh, of any color. Uh, and, you know, just not hearing the gaslighting. I got a lot of gaslighting and finally I got the right ballot. Turns out a lot of people um, in different districts got the wrong ballot. So um, that's something I'm working on right now or and writing and talking and um, it's just unbelievable that, anyway. Richland County has a lot of problems with their election commission, <laughs> but it's just, you know, I expected hiccups with COVID. I didn't expect wrong ballots, getting gaslighted to death, being told that I didn't know what I was talking about. And, you know, I don't play the librarian card very often because it doesn't matter, but I was like, I know how to look up something on Google. I know what my district is. Thank you very much. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's my story. Uh, thanks so much for that, Heather. That that's wonderful. Um, and a reminder to all of you: don't don't mess with librarians because they know <laughs> a lot of things. Um, so, Brett, did you have anything you wanted to add or take us to next? Well, yeah, there's other things I want to touch. It's uh, almost eight. We've got thirty minutes. Let me just throw out some bullet points that I want to see we cover, and then let people respond to them. One is. Um, when you, when you start a task, it's like, think about your job is going to dig a hole. Look and see if somebody's already started the hole. You may be able to start like four feet deep. One thing. Um, violence. Where does violence work into our work to make change and sustain change? We start off with the end of sustaining it. If you don't have the capacity to be able to keep what it is that you've gained, you're going to lose and it's going to be ugly. Um, I'm in the school of thought that believes that we can't really make change in this country um, without a popular movement supporting it. They've got all the money and they got plenty of guns and they have proven that they don't have any morality in being able to use the money and guns, rounding up large numbers of people and locking them up. And so we, we just, if, if, if what we believe is actually true, it should be popular. If we're building a popular movement, people should want to own it and be part of it. And so that's that beloved community you keep hearing us refer to, then let's just make something that people want to be part of. And that's the way we're going to build the capacity to be able to grow new leadership, uh, have many heads so you can't cut off one and kill the beast, that we can become something that people want to be part of, become popular, and there's more of us than are them. And so that was another point. And the other one was um, that the inside outside game, which we've spoken of before, we need to talk about more. I don't, we don't have a whole lot of time to deal with this tonight because in part, some of that is a political operation that is not part of our nonpartisan work, but we can identify that we have a game to be able to win, to make headway, to gain hearts and minds and to build trust by playing in an arena, political arena, that is really dirty. 
and it's, it's, it's dirty by nature. And you know, if you swim in those waters, you're going to get dirty, but you can do it in a principled fashion. And what would happen is what happened to us after 14 years of running the only political caucus. It was a progressive caucus of the South Carolina Democrat Party. The only caucus that existed is we were able to embarrass the South Carolina Democratic Party at conventions with over a thousand people on the floor by controlling the floor and showing that the leadership was hypocritically not even following their own platform. And so they passed rules after we embarrassed them terribly in 2014 about Medicaid expansion where their gubernatorial candidate said, I can't touch Obamacare because he had to win some Republicans as opposed to the 700,000 people that weren't voting that didn't have health care. And that um, the, uh, they changed the bylaws, created caucuses, and, and they said that any caucus would have to be, uh, have the chair appoint, the chair of the caucus would be appointed by the chair of the party, and that they had to, caucuses had to do all this stuff. And we said, we're not a cheerleading team. We're, we're, an, we're here to influence the outcome of the process. So we stepped aside. But that inside outside game is something we've perfected that no one else has in South Carolina. And it is lame, it's wounded now. Uh, and that most of the people that we're working with, they're not actually delegates in the Democratic Party for the reasons that we feel necessary that some of us need to wade into that game. So that's another discussion. If you stay with the network, you'll be hearing that. Um, this, there's skill sessions that we want to do that we can't do uh, during the school that are adjunct to the school that we've really never been able to do a good job of because there's too few of us and too little money. But now we have Zoom and we have a building and we have more people. And so we're going to be doing what we've wanted to do and done and um, some, some, <laughs> we've done some work on and having workshops uh, on everything from learning how the government works and what tools to use to do research and to use your library to do the research for you. I love them. And um, skill sessions on talking, public speaking, press conferences, et cetera, that we can offer to any organization or any individual that wants to do something. And um, this is something we'll be doing on a regular basis pandemic or not, uh, in the coming years. Robert, I think that's a, the main things I have. Let's see who else has got something to add. Oh, uh, that some of the things that we want to be, that we're speaking of tonight, you'd be thinking of because the last class, the next class, uh, is the class on what you're going to do with what you've learned. And we, we, we expect everyone to, to uh, have a plan to do something, even if it's like, gee, I'm going to be a, a, you know, a more educated voter and a better citizen. But the, the practicum class, class 10, is scheduled for June 29, which is two weeks from now. And so in a week, we can have another discussion. And y'all are welcome to respond to any of our emails and talk to me or talk to one of our other faculty members or one of the first file staff people we have about how you can plug in. I mean, I, I, I think Cecil wanted to know if we had a a speakers bureau and I said we do now Cecil help and so um, I'm seeing that Julie's going to help with our fair housing uh, thing we have a seat on the fair housing board that, that, uh, that would be wonderful to have somebody in the housing industry on it and so there's things like that that we're doing that's a natural fit there's general programs that we're doing that you've heard us talking about uh, and so um, do please contribute to the discussion tonight come next Monday for discussions more about tailoring what it is you feel passionate about with what needs to be done and how we can help you roll that ball. Um, I'm going to ask any of our uh, comrades, we call it the cadre, the people that all of them have either graduated a number of years ago from this school, they're veterans and they're, they've been what we would call staff people if we actually paid them uh, and see if they have any comments, including our communication director, Becky Robbins. Um. I don't have anything to say about that, but I did want to mention that I was, what woke me happened in third grade. And so I'm asking everybody to think a little bit differently about how you reach people because um, I had the good fortune in third grade to have a teacher who uh, trusted us with really difficult material. And that was, the right after MLK had been murdered and he trusted us with bad information and spent long hours showing us that was back in the day when they had the, you know, the big video thing. I'm not videos. They had the big 
reeled reel to reels and things would always break. But anyway, the, it, there was these these really intense sessions that we had in third grade about race and um, power and class and stuff like that. And so by fourth grade, I was woke enough to, uh, when we were offered a chance to do a school-wide essay contest about who's your hero. And you were supposed to write an essay and do a portrait. And um, I chose Martin Luther King because I knew all about him and had really been moved a in a very deep way by his story. And um, I won second place and my best friend won first place. And she had chosen Richard Nixon. Oh, and so that was my first really bitter taste of politics. And um, that was fourth grade. So I'm just asking y'all that when you're thinking about projects and doing things that you think not just about your peers, but think about kids in your life or, you know, um, they're really more capable than you give them credit for, by and large, for what they can absorb and how deeply it might move them. And um, so in fourth grade, I was also, I happened upon, because it wasn't in my curriculum, a book called Girls Are Equal Too. And it blew my mind. It really, literally, just like, what? So all of the questions I'd had about why were there no women Michelangelo's or you know, why, you know, all of these things that, that people had thrown back at me, like if women are equal, well, why, 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 why? And I finally had answers for those things and it was so empowering. And so that, those two experiences in third and fourth grade really set me on a course for the rest of my life in terms of how I processed information, questioning authority, questioning information given to you and really believing, um, in your own power to affect change. So those are my thoughts. Start young people, start young. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. That brings me up to the point that we had a teacher, I mean, a student in our class, I think it was four years ago, who's moved to Columbia to take care of her grandchildren, who was a PhD education instructor for grammar school children on bias and racism. And she's been looking for somebody to help her, Dr. Hale, and creating something that is reaching out the Majeska School into the grammar schools, which we've wanted to do since our inception. I haven't heard from uh, any of the other cadre folks about things that they see us needing to do that could in touch on some of the things that people have raised that they may want to do. Well, I'm not in the cod. Oh, is somebody else about to talk? Go for it. I'm not in the cadre, but well, first of all, I'll say that, um, you know, I refer to myself and I hope my language, I apologize in advance if my language offends anyone as a recovering self righteous asshole. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, um, I value spaces like this that are termed as activist or woke or whatever, because inevitably they always remind me of the areas where I need to work on myself. And so I found that week after, even though I might not have been, um, you know, self-disclosing about that uh, in every moment, I definitely have found this to also be a space to really reflect on my own lack of humility and um, how that gets in the way of uh, the ability to really be in unity. Because, you know, to Omari's point, I don't think that we, I think there are, you know, reasons that I'm not going to ramble on about, um, you know, and I don't think that segregated spaces racially or class or by experience, excuse me, are always, um, like if people are asking for that, who am I or anybody else, you know, if people want an all black space, who am I or anybody else to challenge that is what I'm saying. 
And I think that, you know, there are ways, like I found myself in this current moment feeling overwhelmed and disoriented with trying to, actually some of Julie's points about figuring out the best way to move, and, um, you know, as a white person, as a teacher, as a, you know, in all of this and addressing racial injustice and all types of injustice and really sort of putting this very um, harsh, you know, um, need to choose, like, you know, like, do I go to, you know, basically surge, which is like mostly white people organizing around working in mostly white spaces to address white supremacy? Do I go to the progressive network? Do I just continue, you know, um, work in other spaces that are majority black or, you know, just all kinds of questions. And one thing that has come up for me is I don't have to choose, <laughs> you know, like if I'm invited into a space and again, the key is being invited because, you know, one thing about white supremacy is like, you know, um, sometimes we as white people, at least in my experience, can sort of insert ourselves in situations like Columbus and then be, you know, hey, like, uh, aren't you so, you know, aren't you so lucky that we're here now, you know, and so not wanting to, um, to colonize or insert myself in any way. But what I'm coming to feel within myself is a stronger orientation and clarity. And this space has helped me arrive at that. The number one, I don't have to choose. Um, and, and, you know, there are things that I value, but also things that I question and critique in every single space, you know? And I think that's okay. Like, I think um, I sometimes, I'm sort of like looking for this Shangri-La that doesn't exist, <laughs> you know? Like, where is the space that is, you know, the most righteous? And again, I realize that that's my own, you know, self-righteous asshole, you know, like that's part of how it manifests. So that's one thing. At the same time, I'll reiterate something that I brought up last time, which is there is in South Carolina, what I think of as an extreme turfism, um, even within the um, leftist quote unquote spaces. And um, I would just, you know, I am seeking myself and I'm inviting anyone else who is concerned about this to, you know, I don't know, I think it serves divide and conquer. Like we can celebrate the different strengths of different groups, but I honestly think that it serves divide and conquer to sort of say that there's one group that should do one thing like instead of like kind of promoting our own group whatever that is or promoting our own selves whatever that is i'm more interested in looking for ways that we can be coordinated even if that means we're not necessarily coordinated because we're in the same rooms together because some people don't want to be in the same room with me for example you know but it doesn't mean that i can't listen and pay attention to what they are publicly saying and then move in a way that is coordinated to support them um, if that makes sense and so um you know that's what i'm looking for and why because i'm tired of incrementalism you know yeah, like, yes, I agree. Change takes time. I'm looking for the Achilles heel here and I want to, um, you know, punch a nail through it. Like there is an Achilles heel of these power structures. And I feel like we are much better able to get to it if we are coordinated. Again, even if that coordination just means that we are humble and aware enough to say, you know what, I don't hear the voices of black women or trans people or whoever it is whose voice is missing in this conversation. So let me go and look for those voices, not, not like I said, being like Columbus and inserting myself in their meeting, but like social media. Let me go find those voices on social media and see what they're saying and really listen to what they're saying and seeing if there's something in the way that I am moving that can support them, not in this like performative, like look at me because and I'm such a good white person because I certainly, 
you know, that's part of being a self-righteous asshole is like, you know, pointing out my righteousness um, at different points in time that I'm really working on. But in a way that, that, you know, whether it's public or private, and probably it needs to be mostly private, that actually pushes the ball forward. So that's what I'm interested in. Well, thank you, Julia, because that really does bring up a need that we, that we, the Progressive Network has for you to help us accomplish that, which we set out to do 25 years ago, which was to build that collective space that you referred to as cooperative space, cooperative space, the network. That's why we started as the network with 28 different organizations to be able to create that space. And we don't have to choose to you know, have segregated or integrated work because we're uh, adaptive and respectful of that. I mean, I was involved with, with the white people left the Southern, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 60s for the white people to go form the Southern Student Organizing Committee because their understanding of the need for that's the type of spaces to be able to rally those that you have that type of intimate relationship with. But we also are advancing uh, with the capacity to make change, recognizing that those differences make us all stronger. And there's a, um, Chairman Mao once said something that, that makes more sense as you get older, a revolutionary must be well shod on all four feet. So we need to have these different attributes and recognize that the enemy of my enemy is my ally. I don't have to like you, but if you don't like the people that I'm fighting, you're my ally. And so that's kind of a, a, a maturity that comes with the struggle uh, that we've been working on for a long time and we, we have, because of the inherent discriminations and shortcomings, et cetera, in the system, we haven't been able to be able to attract the type of black leadership that I can show you things I wrote 50 years ago that said we're not going to make a revolution in this country without black leadership. Uh, we, you know, I'm a privileged guy that's been able to like scuffle and hustle and whatnot and keep myself as a professional activist in a state where there's no money to do that. And so we recognize these things and welcome welcome criticism to make us stronger and input to make us better. We've got a few minutes left, more comments? Um, I know Dr. Shaw had a comment he wanted to make uh, briefly. This was just an amen comment to, to Julia's point about um, be, being tired of incrementalism. Uh, and I, and I, um, it, it, I count myself also as a radical pragmatist, but I, but I know that pragmatism um, doesn't 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 uh, on some level uh, speak to, to people's sense of urgency sometimes sometimes and so um, but what I would encourage is, is as as I've sort of witnessed this Julia is for instance it's I don't think it's a complete coincidence and we'd have to unpack it to say that um, these it's not an independent uh, aspect that the Supreme Court rate uh, came to the conclusion it did today on LGBTQ rights in the midst of what's going on in this social format. Now, I won't say that they were completely moved <laughs> by what's happening outdoors, but we do know that sometimes cha change um, occurs in such way that uh, there's a sort of punctuated point in, in, a, in history. And change is all, it seems like a floodgate opens, right? Much of that is it's not a matter of was it gradualism or was it uh, punctuated change? It's both. It's the sense that things built up, uh, and then these opportunities um, sort of came forward. And and to Brett's point about sort of progressive leadership, there's all types of progressive leadership, and particularly young African American leadership that I'm seeing now in the midst of this uprising, right? And so of course the trick is to how to connect with folk, uh, how to th figure about, you know, lead, follow, follow, or get out the way, all of these sort of intricate dynamics. But I would say, Julia, ma maintain your, your sense of urgency and your impatience, your righteous impatience, uh, because that's very important uh, to, 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 it's the person who's righteously impatient who says, let's now, do, let's now move. <laughs> now we can really punk, you know, punch, uh, into this thing and make a difference, whereas more cautious souls might say, nah, let's give it a little more time to bake. So just give it an amen. That's all, Julia. <laughs>
Well, I've, I have a sense that everybody's cup is full here this evening. I do want to leave you with a thought that I'm going to ask next time. And I've asked this at previous classes that I'm hoping that what we're doing is getting you to understand that you can be comfortable being militant and not nonviolent and being a radical and not irrational and being a revolutionary and somebody that is full of love. And those are things that I think Dr. King manifested, some of the, some of the people that I've thought the most of manifested and something I strive to be, because we definitely need a revolution in this, on this planet, <laughs> we're gonna lose it. And that we have to be full of love to be able to communicate the unity that we need to overcome that. And that we must do it strongly and militant with the enthusiasm that Julia just evidenced and the lack of patience and the presumptuousness of being a revolutionary to be able to pull it off. And so you will be asked that question before you leave. So Dr. Green, you wanna take us home and make sure that people, if you haven't told me the size of the t-shirt that you want. I mean, some people get new cars when they graduate. You're gonna get a brand new Majesca School t-shirt. Congratulations, kids. If you tell us the size that you wear in the chat box, if you haven't done so. Dr. Green, take it. Well, all I'll say is um, I think what tonight's class has reminded us of is that, you know, organizing is hard, but it's worthwhile. Um, organizing is hard, but it has to be done. And after what Brett has just said, the revolution will not be televised, but you will get a free t-shirt. So keep that in mind. Um, but again, this has been another wonderful class. Um, again, I, I've been glad to hear from so many folks about why they're doing this class, why they're invested in, in organizing and activism. And again, I look forward to seeing you guys very soon. Make sure to let Brett know what your t-shirt size is. And come back Monday to carry on this conversation if there's something you need to say that you haven't said. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, good night folks. Good night, everyone, good to see you. Be safe, be well. Have a good one.